Hello and welcome to Indus News live from Islamabad. I am Muneeb Hamid with the news of this hour. Let's begin with the headlines first. Azerbaijan's president Ilham Aliyev says the Azeri army has liberated seven more villages from the Armenian occupation. Meanwhile, ethnic Armenian forces said 51 more service personnel have been killed in the conflict over the Nagorno-Karabakh region. Earlier, Turkey rejected Armenia's demand for a ceasefire after a week of fierce fighting. Britain and France have posted record high rise in daily coronavirus cases since the second wave of the pandemic. In a video, US President Donald Trump says he is doing well, but the next few days will be the real test. Meanwhile, India has recorded 940 deaths and 76,000 new cases in the past 24 hours. Here in Pakistan, six more people have lost their lives to the virus, raising the toll to 6,513. While globally, the coronavirus has claimed over a million and 31,000 lives and infected 34.7 million. Voters in Kyrgyzstan are casting their ballots in the country's parliamentary elections. A total of 16 parties are contesting 120 seats in the single-chamber parliament. Three poll surveys predict President Soron Bai, Genbikov's party is likely to win a significant number of seats in the legislature. News coming in detail after a short break. Stay back now let's start the news in detail we begin from Azerbaijan whose president Ilham Aliyev says the Azeri army has liberated seven more villages from the Armenian occupation amid fierce fighting over the Nagorno-Karabakh region Aliyev said that Azerbaijani soldiers have also hoisted the flag over the town of Madagiz the Azeri president added that he had reinstated the town's historical name Sugu Vushan Meanwhile, ethnic Armenian forces said 51 more service personnel have been killed in the conflict. Earlier, Turkey rejected Armenia's demands for a ceasefire after a week of fierce fighting. In an interview, Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu said Russia can play a mediating role in a ceasefire only if it is neutral. The dispute is centered on the control of the Nagorno-Karabakh region, which is internationally recognized as part of Azerbaijan, but controlled by the ethnic Armenians. Now, Britain and France have posted record high rises in the daily number of coronavirus cases in the past 24 hours. France has reported 17,000 new cases with 49 additional deaths, while in Britain the health ministry reported almost 13,000 new cases. Meanwhile, India has recorded 940 deaths and nearly 76,000 new cases in the past 24 hours. Globally, the coronavirus has claimed over a million and 31,000 lives and infected 34.7 million. Details in this report. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to batter the Americas, second wave is now raging in Western Europe. Both France and the UK are struggling to keep the spread of the virus in check merely weeks after returning to an almost normal daily life. In Latin America, Brazil continues to report consistently higher numbers, although it is no longer considered the global epicenter. Meanwhile, New York-based Regeneron Pharmaceuticals talked up its COVID-19 treatment after Trump's medical team opted to use its antibody cocktail. What our approach is, is simply we've pioneered technologies over the last 20 plus years that allow us to make the best of antibodies that humans would normally make against the virus, but we can make these outside of the body. We can grow them in these large bioreactors, highly purify and concentrate them, and then give them back to patients. Over in mainland China, authorities reported 16 new imported cases with zero new locally transmitted infections. Elsewhere in Australia's largest state of Victoria, the cases crept up into double digits 
as 12 people were diagnosed with the coronavirus overnight. In a televised briefing, Victoria Premier Daniel Andrews urged the public to not do anything selfish that could potentially keep them in a longer lockdown. Let's not any of us do anything to jeopardise uh, where, where we find ourselves. It's delicately poised, but we are there, ready. If we continue these numbers, continue this trend, we are ready to take that step, all things being equal, in just a couple of weeks' time. Uh, it's not too much for all of us just to, to, to see this thing through. That's the only option we have. Uh, if, we, if we try and shortcut this thing, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll be back where we were weeks and months ago. Earlier, Tunisian authorities banned all gatherings and reduced working hours for employees in the public sector to stop the rapid spread of the coronavirus. The African nation's tourism-dependent economy has contracted by 21.6% in the second quarter due to the pandemic-related measures. Meanwhile, US President Donald Trump says he has been feeling better since arriving at a military facility, but next few days will be a real test. President Trump and the First Lady Melania Trump have been in quarantine after testing positive for COVID-19. White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows reportedly said next 48 hours will be critical for President Trump. He said President's vitals over the last 24 hours were very concerning and he is yet to be on a clear path to recovery. President Trump said the physicians will know his condition for sure in a few days, but he hopes to be back soon. I had no choice because I just didn't want to stay in the White House. I was given that alternative. Stay in the White House, lock yourself in, don't ever leave, don't even go to the Oval Office. Just stay upstairs and enjoy it. Don't see people, don't talk to people, and just be done with it. And I can't do that. I had to be out front, and this is America. This is the United States. This is the greatest country in the world. This is the most powerful country in the world. I can't be locked up in a room upstairs. Meanwhile, White House physician Sean Conley said Trump has been fever-free for the last 24 hours. Now, Pakistan's Prime Minister Imran Khan has warned against a possible second wave of coronavirus in the country. In a tweet, Khan said the spike in coronavirus infections can be triggered by the onset of winter. The Prime Minister urged people to strictly ensure the implementation of SOPs and wear masks in public areas. Six people have lost their lives to COVID-19 over the past 24 hours, raising the death toll to 6,513. The health ministry says over 600 more tested positive overnight. It says there are 9,135 total active cases in the country. The ministry said out of over 314,000 detected cases, more than 298,000 have recovered so far. It said over 138,000 cases have been detected in the Sindh province, while over 99,000 reported in Punjab. The National Command and Operations Centre says 95 people across the country are on ventilators. Now, New Delhi has refused to open the Kartarpur corridor for the Indian Sikhs wanting to visit their holy place in Pakistan. The government says the corridor cannot be opened because of COVID-19 while at the same time India has opened the Taj Mahal for tourists. Indian Ministry of External Affairs spokesperson says the corridor will be opened in accordance with the easing of restrictions. Pakistan reopened the corridor from its side of the border on Friday in wake of overall improvement in COVID-19 situation in the country. Visitors are allowed to come daily from dawn to dusk. Indian investigators have exhumed the bodies of three young men in western Baravala district of Okubai, Jammu and Kashmir. This comes two weeks after the Indian military in a rare admission said its soldiers exceeded their legal powers in killing the men. Police said their team and medical officials handed the bodies over to their families for burial. The father of one of the victims said the three were killed in cold blood. Occupy in Kashmir has been reeling under a curfew ever since India revoked its special status last year. Dozens of Kashmiris have been killed at the hands of Indian troops in fake encounters. A notorious emergency power act allows the Indian forces to search and even shoot suspects without any prosecution. For years now, Kashmiri civilians and activists have accused Indian troops of abusing their powers and repeatedly targeting innocent civilians. Meanwhile, Afghanistan's chairman of the High Council for National Reconciliation, Abdullah Abdullah, has briefed President Ashraf Ghani over his recent visit to Pakistan. 
Abdullah met with Ghani at the presidential palace. In a Twitter post, President Spokesperson Sadiq Siddiqui said the two officials discussed the ongoing peace process and the way forward. Abdullah had held meetings with Pakistan's President Arif Alvi, Prime Minister Imran Khan and the Foreign Minister this week. He is scheduled to travel to India next week. Now moving on, thousands of Israelis have defied a ban on anti-Guffin protests to demand Prime Minister Netanyahu's resignation. A new law bans Israelis from holding demonstrations more than one kilometer from their homes and forces stricter social distancing rules. Violence broke out as a handful of protest locations among over a thousand throughout the country. A police spokesperson says 38 protesters have been arrested as they gather near Netanyahu's residency for the 15th straight week. The demonstrators called for Prime Minister's resignation over his indictment and mishandling of COVID-19 pandemic. Netanyahu is on trial for bribery, fraud and breach of trust. Now, Hamas has called for speeding up intra-Palestinian talks to reach a national roadmap for achieving reconciliation. Last month, the group held talks with its rival Fatah in Istanbul to discuss ways of achieving a partnership between the two. In a statement, Hamas said the meetings constituted a prelude to comprehensive Palestinian dialogue. It called for creating a favorable atmosphere to reaching solutions to the outstanding issues as a step towards unity. The talks came almost three weeks after the Palestinian factions agreed during meetings in Ramallah and Beirut to hold free and transparent elections. A French-Iranian academic, Fariba Adelka, has been temporarily released from prison and is currently in Tehran. According to her lawyer, Adelka has been released with an electronic bracelet and is now with her family. Her attorney said he hopes this temporary release will become final. A research director at Sciences Po University in Paris, Adelka was arrested in June last year. She was sentenced in May to five years in prison for allegedly conspiring against national security. Adelka is a citizen of Iran and France, but Tehran does not recognize dual nationality. Now, Iraqi forces have arrested 26 suspected ISIS militants in a security swoop in the northern Nineveh province. In a statement, the Defense Ministry said the militants were detained after receiving information from terrorists already in captivity. The statement said the suspects confessed of carrying out terrorist attacks against the security forces. In 2017, officials in Baghdad declared the military presence of ISIS in Iraq had been all but destroyed. But the terrorists still have a presence in rural areas of Anbar, Viyala, Kirkuk, Saladin and Mosul. The Iraqi army continues to carry out operations against the groups in parts of the country. Now, a human rights watch says Rohingya Muslims are being subjected to institutional oppressions in Myanmar's detention camps. In a statement, the international watchdog said the Myanmar government is committing grave rights violations in confinement centers. It said about 130,000 Rohingya are detained in the camp since being displaced in a 2012 campaign of ethnic cleansing by the Myanmar's military. It added, the conditions amount to the crimes against humanity of the apartheid, persecution and severe deprivation of liberty. Human Rights Watch urged Naipi Dao to lift all arbitrary movement restrictions for Rohingya, Kaman and other minorities. Now, Muslims in Saudi Arabia have been allowed to perform the Umrah pilgrimage after seven months hiatus due to the coronavirus pandemic. Saudi state media said in the first phase, 6,000 people began performing the pilgrimage under strict social distancing measures. It said 15,000 pilgrims will be allowed in the second phase that will begin on the 18th of October. Visitors from abroad will be permitted from 1st of November after the capacity is raised to 20,000 pilgrims per day. The state media said 100% revival of the pilgrimage is subject to the end of the pandemic. More news coming up in this bulletin after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back now. Moving on with the news stories. Belarusian security forces say they have detained 11 people for participating in what they called unauthorized protests in Minsk. 
A spokesperson for the police said no journalists were among those detained during the latest protest. This comes after the United States slapped sanctions on eight Belarusian officials, including Interior Minister Yuri Karev. In a statement, U.S. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin said, Belarusians' democratic rights have been met with violence from officials. The European Union has also blacklisted 40 officials accused of rigging August's presidential elections in Belarus. Responding, Belarus announced its retaliatory sanctions against the European Union. The foreign ministry said Minsk believes in dialogue but is determined to respond to unfriendly actions. Now, Germany says the European Union will have to impose sanctions on Russia if it's confirmed that Alexei Navalny was poisoned with a bad nerve agent. In an interview, German Foreign Minister Heiko Maas said there will be a clear response from the European Union with no way around sanctions. Maas said such a serious violation of the International Chemical Weapons Convention cannot remain unanswered. Berlin claims Navalny was poisoned with a substance from the Soviet-developed Novichok Group. The EU is awaiting the conclusion of an investigation by the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons before taking any action. Earlier, Russian said German Foreign Ministry has refused Moscow's request for consular access to Navalny. Now, voters in Kyrgyzstan are casting their ballots in the country's parliamentary elections. A total of 16 parties are contesting 120 seats in the single chamber parliament. Pre-poll surveys predicts present Soron Bai, Jin B. Ko's party is likely to win a significant number of seats in the legislature. Jen Bikov's campaign was marred by allegations of vote buying. The current ruling coalition is certain to be upset due to internal splits in the two major political groups. The two parties being seen as strongest in elections are Birim Dik and Mekanim Kyrgyzstan. The Birim Dik is viewed as loyal to Jin Bikov and includes his brother and former parliamentary speaker among its candidates. Its main rival, Mekanim Kyrgyzstan, was the target of last year's anti-corruption protests. Meanwhile, the United States has conducted military training and reconnaissance drills around the Korean Peninsula amid rising tensions with China. This comes after Beijing simultaneously held military drills in the South and East China Seas earlier this week. American Pacific Air Forces said U.S. Air Force conducted the Joint Bomber Task Force with Japanese Air Self-Defense Forces in the East Sea. It said the bombers also conducted joint training with a U.S. Navy Growler, an electronic carrier-based aircraft. The American Navy also deployed its reconnaissance aircraft above South Korea's western shores. The training comes amid fragile inter-Korean relations and an upcoming North Korean military parade. Now more than 2,500 firefighters are battling the wildfires as they deploy water-dropping helicopters in the U.S. state of California. The fire continues to rage in the foothills of the Napa Valley and has already destroyed 248 homes and burned over 63,000 acres of land. California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection said the low moisture, warm and dry weather conditions are contributing to active fires. Earlier, the National Weather Service issued red flag warnings for high winds for the following two days. California Governor Gavin Newsom has blamed decades of poor forest management for the fires. The fires have claimed 30 lives in California, while 10 in Oregon and Washington since the 15th of August. Now, two people have died and at least 25 are missing after the powerful storm Alex hit southern France and northwestern Italy. The storm's high speed winds and torrential rains have caused severe floods in Italy. Local government officials say 17 people are missing in Italy, including a group of at least four German trackers. Roads and bridges have been swept away by floodwaters as several rivers overflowed their banks. In France, authorities say eight people are reported to be missing. Meteorological agency Meteo France said 450 millimeters of rain fell in some areas in just 24 hours, which is equivalent to four months of the downpour. Tropical storm Gamma has made landfall on the eastern side of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The U.S. National Hurricane Center says the storm has weakened, but authorities issued hurricane warnings in the area. 
The Hurricane Center said the storm touched down at the beach city of Tulum with maximum sustained winds of 112 kilometers per hour. The center says the local population should take necessary precautions to protect life and property. Gamma is forecast to bring as much as 381 millimeters rain over the next several days amid fears of flash flooding and mudslides. Now, Egypt has put on show of dozens of coffins belonging to priests and clerks from the 26th dynasty nearly 2,500 years ago. The 59 coffins were discovered in August at the UNESCO World Heritage Site south of Cairo. Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, Secretary General Mustafa Al Waziri, said tens more coffins were found in the vast Saqqara necropolis just two days ago. The coffins were buried in three 10 to 12 meter shafts, along with 28 statues of the ancient Egyptian god Sikhem. Waziri said the coffins were uncovered in perfect condition due to a protective seal that preserved them from chemical reactions. He said an Egyptian archaeological mission will continue opening the coffins and studying their contents. The psychophagoses will be displayed at the Grand Egyptian Museum, expected to open next year. A group of Palestinian teenagers has been practicing parkour in a blockaded Gaza Strip among the damaged buildings and rubble. Despite the opposition of their families, they resume their urban activity, which involves climbing and running over buildings and grounds. Details in this report. Leaping on a building and flipping through the air, jumping over obstacles, these Palestinian parkour athletes hope to make a name for themselves. The boys are leaping to new heights without formal training. I have been doing parkour for two years. Now I'm 14 years old. We have to prefer these abandoned areas because there is no alternative. Despite the opposition of their families, they resume their activity, which involves climbing and running over buildings and grounds. They have another obstacle which they must leap over, that is the lack of support and facilities. We gathered for training in an abandoned area close to everyone. We don't have a stadium or a club. We prefer such demolished places to demonstrate our sports. We couldn't find anyone to support us. In spite of Israeli blockade of Gaza Strip and West Bank, the determined group of parkour athletes resumes the urban activity. Palestinian authorities say Israeli airstrikes have damaged thousands of houses in the Gaza city. Some 65,000 Palestinians were left homeless in Gaza, where infrastructure was badly damaged due to the attacks. Now let's have a look at the weather updates. Well, that is all for now for the latest update.